Welcome to our lecture number 15. Today we talk about the global water cycles. And as you know, water is becoming a big problem nowadays. And in some respect, it's even more important than the energy problem. In any case, there's a lot of relation between the water cycle and our energy problems, as I will show later. So as you know, our lecture is about energy, carbon and water. And today it's time for discussing the water. The global water cycle, you probably know from school, so I don't have to go into any details here. The planet is covered with oceans and the oceans evaporate water vapor. And of course, the driving energy behind that is the sun, of course. The sun evaporates the water. It also produces the wind and also the wind evaporates the water. And then you have different types of water coming down on the ground again and I don't want to discuss those things in detail now but I would like to draw a similar complicated sketch like I did in the global carbon cycle but I like those sketch where there are a lot of things in it and once you have understood it you can compress all the information into one slide basically. So let's start from the beginning. How does the water cycle globally work? How did it start in nature? Well, of course, on Earth there is rain and snowfall. And then, of course, you can use that for drinking. Drinking is a product in this circle, which is most important for the people, of course. Without drinking, you cannot survive. So the rain goes on the ground. And then on the ground, you have rivers, lakes and wells. That is how usually people collect the water to use it. But one can assume that already at the beginning of mankind, people changed the flow of the water because it was so important for them. And it's not only men who did that, even animals do that. Here, for example, you see a dam made by a beaver. So the beavers stopped the water to make small lakes. And that's the way how they basically do their own fish farms already. The next kind of water we have is the groundwater. That is the water which is below our ground and which of course is most important for agriculture. In a lot of regions, plants are just growing because of the groundwater. The soil is wet. It gets wet by rain and then the water stays there. In detail, of course, you can study where there is groundwater, how deep it is. And then you just come to all these hydrological aspects. What is the reason for the groundwater? Well, normally the reason is that part of the soil is sandy, for example. So the water sucks into the soil and makes it wet. Then it goes deeper and at some point there might be a sediment of rocks. Then the water cannot go deeper anymore and there it's then collected and it flows to some area which is lower and then you have all the dynamics of the groundwater. Depending on where you are, the groundwater can be just a few centimeters under the ground, so the groundwater level, or it can be 100 meters deep, then people make fountains and they take out the water from there. But there's another origin of water that we are using, and that is glaciers. Glaciers collect the snow, and then depending on the temperatures, part of it melts or it just flows slowly down into the valley, and then starts to melt there in the summer. And there are big areas on the planet which depend completely on the water from the glaciers. Even a big part of Asia depends on the glaciers in the Himalaya. And nowadays people can be really lucky there because of global warming. There's more and more water from these glaciers melting. And this flows into the valley and into the surrounding countries so that the rivers there carry quite a lot of water. And this glacial water even comes in the summer when there is little rainfall, for example. But of course, unfortunately, the amount of glaciers is limited and due to global warming, at some point, all the glaciers will be melted 
and then it becomes really bad in these areas, especially in Asia you can expect that there the rivers in the hot periods will not carry any water anymore and this will become a big problem in future. And there's the last one of these sources of water and this is humidity. So there are quite a few plants which can just live from the humidity of the air. They don't have any roots, they just lay around and collect the water from the surrounding, from the humidity of the atmosphere around. But there are other examples where humidity is used by nature. This is a picture from my favorite island, La Gomera, which is outside of the coast of Africa. This small island is in the middle of the ocean and of course the air at the ocean is quite humid. And what happens at this island here, so the island has high mountains, the air from the wind in the ocean is pushed up the mountains and this is now a physics effect. If air is going uphill, the air pressure reduces so the air expands. When air expands, it becomes colder. So the humid, cold air arrives at the top. On the top there is a forest. Because the air is cooled down, the relative humidity of the air is increasing. So if you learn physics, you learn to distinguish between the absolute humidity, which tells you how much water there is in the air, and the relative humidity, this tells you how much water the air can carry at a certain temperature and the relative humidity is then the percentage of that what the air can carry. So it turns out that the relative humidity then increases and becomes very high, close to 100%. And at that point, of course, depending on the temperature, you start to build clouds and therefore the forest on top there is call, also called a cloud forest. These clouds have small water droplets and they are collected by the leaves of the forest and they drop down and this way the whole island gets its water so the humidity falls down to the ground, it builds small rivers down to the valley and in the valley then you have water basically all the year because of this cloud forest. So that is the way how nature learned to use humidity for growing plants on a whole island. So these are basically all the important sources of water which nature gives us. And of course, the main reason why we need it is not only for drinking, but more important is agriculture. For agriculture, we need a lot more water than we can drink. So also in our modern society, agriculture is the main user of water. The next thing we, why we need water then of course is some people sometimes want to wash themselves, wash their clothes, wash their food. So you need water for households and in the modern times of course a really big amount of water is needed for industry. This we call nowadays the virtual water in the sense that for example if you buy a car, this car needed a lot of water. You don't see the water on the car, therefore you call it the virtual water. So this is what we call also the footprint of water in relation to the footprint of CO2. And that tells you how much water a certain product needs to be constructed or to be grown. Also if you eat a banana, for example on the island La Gomera, which I showed before, there are grown banana in the valley and the valley gets the water from the mountains and for growing bananas you need quite a lot of water. So the water footprint of bananas is relatively high. The next reason why we need water in our modern society is hydropower. And there we are at the subject of our lecture, which is energy mainly. So these dams which you produce 
have normally two reasons. The first one is to control the water flow and the second one is to produce energy like for example here in this hydropower station at the Columbia River. The first one to control the water flow we saw already in nature at the dams of the beavers and of course for agriculture these dams are even much more important than for the beavers. So for agriculture you have to make sure that you collect the water at the time when there is a lot of rain. So in Europe for example we have most of our rain in the winter. So you collect the water in the winter, you also collect the water which comes out from the snowfalls in spring and then you have a reservoir of water for the rest of the year, especially for the hot summer times. Another reason for dams is to control the water flow of the rivers in case the river is used for ships and boats. This way you can um, make sure that there's always enough water in the rivers. So these dams are built for the combined reason of storing water for the summer and for producing electricity and this of course sometimes gives conflicts. For example we have a dam here close to Gießen and this is used for power production. It is used to have enough water in the river during the whole day also for agriculture and in addition there's a touristic aspect because they use the lake for tourism and if there's no water in the summer in the lake then of course it's bad for tourism. So for a dam there are always these conflicts between the different users of the dam. The next and in my list the last reason to use water in our society which is also related very much to energy is that most of the huge power plants need cooling water. Yeah, you need cooling water in industry but especially you need cooling water in power plants. So why do you need cooling water for a power plant? Well the reason is simple. In all the big power plants which are using coal or lignite or oil or gas and also for nuclear power plants the first thing you produce in the power plant is heat and from the heat you produce steam and from the steam you make the electricity. And this process has a rather low efficiencies. As we will learn later in this lecture the efficiencies are somewhere between maybe 30 and 60 percent. So about half of the energy is wasted. So the energy as well from a coal power plant as well as from a nuclear power plant is converted into heat and the fraction of the heat which is wasted has to be taken away from the power plant. Otherwise the whole power plant would melt or explode. And to cool down the power plant you can use either seawater or river water or the most easiest thing is to use cooling powers. In any case you need a lot of water. Here is an example of a cooling tower. This shows you again the same power station which I showed in one of my previous lectures. So this is the one which is close by to my home when I was a child and this is what we call the cloud factory and as you see on the picture the clouds come out of the cooling towers. Yeah, there is water put in and the water evaporates and then the clouds come out. In this following video clip here you can get a feeling on how much water there is. So you see how the water is injected into the tower and it comes down like in a shower. So at the bottom the air flows in and due to the heat inside there's water vapor and air flowing up to the top. And when the water vapor comes out at the top the hot vapor cools down again and produces these clouds. Just a side remark to this process here. So in the year 2014 it happened that in the next town which is Jülich there was a small epidemic of a kind of pneumonia. Something like 39 people were ill, three were dead afterwards and the doctors found out that the people had Legionnaire's disease. So this is a disease which is caused by a bacterium 
and uh, they were searching for the region and the most likely reason for that was that from this cooling towers the bacteria were distributed as aerosols into the air and then even up to 10 kilometers and further away these aerosols can, came down and made the people ill. So this is an example where you see that whatever you do there are always things happening which you didn't think about before and wherever there is water there is life. In this case it was a bad bacterium and by studying these cooling towers people found a really huge contamination of these cooling towers with this Legionella pneumophilia, these bacteriums which cause the Legionnaire's disease. This is just a side remark, so whatever you do at large scale, you have to check very carefully if you don't change something which you didn't think of before. These cooling towers have to get rid of the power of the plant. So the bigger the plant is, the bigger the cooling power has to be. So here's another example. This is a nuclear power station. Therefore, the cooling tower has to be scaled up. So it's a really huge cooling tower close to this small German village here. So as you probably know, Germany decided to go out of nuclear power, not to use it anymore in future. And therefore last year they pulled down the cooling tower. So this was a big investment which is wasted in a way because somehow our society went into a direction which is not sustainable. As I mentioned at the beginning, today we have big problems with our water cycle and now we come to the reasons for that, to the causes of the problems with our fresh water. So one of the certainly main actors in this business is agriculture. Agriculture uses, as I said before, a very big amount of water and they also change the flow of water. And there are many aspects here. I would just like to mention the most important ones. So when people started to do agriculture at last scale already hundreds of years ago, uh, the first thing they did is deforestation because they needed more land for agriculture. Then the modern agriculture has a lot of ways to use the land in the wrong way and this leads to degradation of soil and a degraded soil often has different properties concerning the ability to suck up water. Also the landscape is changed so that the small rivers and the flow of water is changed in the landscape. And a last thing which we have to mention is irrigation. Irrigation also has a big effect, especially on the salinization of the soils. It's not only agriculture, it's also the energy industry which changes the flow of water. It started in the very early days with using wood for cooking and for heating. This way energy also led to deforestation and change of land use. And then, of course, in the last hundred years, the main effect was that we are using fossil fuels at large scale. This leads to climate change and global warming, and this also has a big effect on the water cycle. Now let's talk about what is being changed in the water cycle. First of all, global warming and climate change changes precipitation. So the amount of rain and snow is changed and also the times at which the rain and snow comes and the duration of the periods of rainfall and drought. This changes a lot our water system. One of the next points is overpopulation and pollution. So it starts with the way that the people put the excrements of themselves and of the animals into the rivers. Of course, due to overpopulation, the amount of pollution is much more than if there are just a few people living on a square kilometer, for example. So here you see an illustration of that. This is nothing new. This is a fecal sludge in the vicinity of Nairobi. 
and you see it, people put in their garbage, their pickles, and this is of course not a new problem. We had it in the Mediterranean ages in all our European towns this way. And here there's a nice poster which explains how this works and what to do about it. I don't want to go into detail at the moment, maybe in one of the later lectures. In the next picture here you see an example of the amount of water which is needed by agriculture. So this shows you a basin flood irrigation. So you put a lot of water on a field so that the ground is becoming full of water. The plants can use the water. And this way you can do agriculture. Of course, this is a way of doing agriculture where you really need a lot of water. So especially in an area like here in Arizona, where it's very hot and dry usually, this of course is a big waste of water, which you certainly can do much better and where in future you have to think about different ways of irrigation and those of course are also being done nowadays. The enormous use of water in agriculture but also in industry typically leads to a groundwater recession then irrigation is increased and if you do irrigation in a hot country what happens there well a lot of this irrigated water evaporates and what is remaining then is salt so by doing irrigation in hot areas you sooner or later will have a salinization of the ground one of the bad examples here is the Aralsee. This is not in a specially hot area now, but due to change of rivers even in the Soviet Union and due to the large amount of water usage in agriculture, the whole huge lake here has been falling dry nowadays. And you also see these white areas of salt in this lake ground. So you really see how big the influence of man is on a whole area. So there's no fishing possible anymore and all the people living in these areas have to change the whole cycle of their life. Then if we come to the next point, we go to climate change. There you have the change of temperatures. You have an increased deforestation because of less water and wrong land use and you have an increase of desertification. So in areas where there have been forests a long time ago, there's more and more deserts coming. We will discuss about that also in one of the coming lectures. So now we have learned how much water we need nowadays with our big population and our modern industry. And obviously due to these changes in many areas, there's not enough water anymore. So what to do about it? And there people started to use new methods. The first one is they were digging for fossil water. The largest example here is the Great Man-Made River Project. This is in Libya. Libya is a country which earned a lot of money from oil and where the population has been growing since decades. And of course, it's a country which is mostly desert and the little bit of water which was available in the old days is of course not sufficient. So they made this great man-made river project where they made long pipelines to the desert, from the deserts to the big towns. In total about 2,800 kilometer underground pipes and these pipes had cross sections of about four meters as you see in this picture here. And where now does the water come from? So the water is fossil water. Fossil water means it was generated a long time ago. In this case, it's coming from the last ice age. So this is really water which was generated a really long time ago and is not sustainable. Of course, it will not be redone until at least not until we have the next ice age. And with this project, Libya 
gets something like six and a half million cubic meters per day of this fossil water taking it out of the reservoir and this project pushed mainly by Gaddafi was a huge project of the country and he promised the country that it will produce water for about 5,000 years so that all the water problems of the country are solved. Nowadays experts predict a lifetime of this fossil water somewhere between 30 and 200 years. So it's certainly not something for the very far future. Maybe already the current generation will already suffer from emptying this fossil reservoir which has been here for thousands of years. So this is certainly not a sustainable method. It's done in many countries and of course it has to stop and we have to stop it as soon as possible because it's not sustainable and we might need the water for later times. Now we come to the second method of artificial water production. This is production from wastewater. So I think the best example to illustrate that is if you go to the outer space. So let's have a look what astronauts do with their water cycle. So of course um, an astronaut needs to have water for drinking for example. And of course there is no source of water on a spaceship. Here is the example of the International Space Station. So what is done there? You have to collect the water. You have to recycle the water. So what's actually happening? An astronaut produces wastewater. People typically are sweating out a lot of water and of course if you drink something uh, you also produce urine. So what is done on a space shuttle? You collect the excrements and the liquid part of it you recycle and the solid part you throw out into the universe. So the recycled liquids contain mainly urine and sweat. There is some wastewater treatment on the space shuttle and from this wastewater you can produce a nice cup of coffee. So actually I never understood why everybody wants to be an astronaut. I don't think this is a very attractive way to live, especially as you don't get the coffee in a nice cup. You get it out of some plastic containment which doesn't look very nice and also it's probably not your own urine which was recycled. So in this sense I much prefer to live on the earth, but on the earth similar things of course happen. If you for example live in a town close to a nice river, what normally happened is your wastewater is treated and put back to the river and then the next town takes out its fresh water out of the river again. Again the wastewater of the people is treated back to the river. So if you live at the end of the river you can imagine that at least part of your fresh water is basically coming from the urine of other people. But this is nature um, on the long scale anyway. All the water we have has been recycled by thousands of animals already in the ancient days. In many countries there are no rivers anymore which you can use for your fresh water, especially in desert areas. And there are also desert areas where there is not enough fossil water anymore. So what to do? The only option which you have then is to use seawater. So you take water from the ocean, you desalinate it and then you have fresh water. This is the, of course in principle the ideal way to produce fresh water. But unfortunately, due to physics reasons, the desalination needs a huge amount of energy. Yeah, this is the negative point about it. So if you have to do desalination of seawater, then you need really a lot of energy. In many cases then it's easier to reuse the wastewater in a more or less closed cycle because the cleaning of wastewater needs less energy 
than the desalination of new water. Here you see one of the biggest desalination plants on the world. This is a picture from Dubai, just taken from Google Street View. So what do you see? You see lots of chimneys. Yeah, for the whole horizon here on this little picture is full of chimneys. These are mainly gas power stations and they produce the energy for most of Dubai. It's like 8.6 gigawatt. But the main purpose, of course, in addition is that they produce fresh water. So they produce 2 million cubic meters per day of fresh water from seawater desalination. And of course, this needs a huge amount of energy. And here all the energy is fossil energy. So it's powered by natural gas, which is available in abundance in this country here. But this gives you an impression how unsustainable our society and especially a society living in the deserts is. It's a huge amount of energy which is needed for the big towns and it's a huge amount of fresh water which is needed. And both of it is done here not in a sustainable way because it uses fossil fuels for it. So basically the production of the fresh water increases global warming due to the fossil fuel consumption and this of course increases the water problems on the earth so that on the long term this is certainly not the right way to do it. So now I gave you an overview of the global water cycle and the problems which we have with it nowadays and of course a lot of the aspects which I showed in these diagrams have to be discussed in more detail and explained in more detail and I will do that in one of the coming lectures. Thank you and hope to see you again in my next lecture. Goodbye.